This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. This month, I've dedicated the whole month to detail the crimes of one of the worst predators Northern California has ever experienced. Curtis Dean Anderson preyed upon women and children in the San Francisco Bay Area and may have been responsible for the disappearance of almost a dozen females beginning in the early 1980s. If not for the bravery of one eight-year-old girl, Anderson may have added even more victims to his grim scoreboard. I'll continue detailing Anderson's crimes from last week. If you haven't yet listened to episode 193, you'll want to start there. In the last episode, seven-year-old Ziana Fairchild went missing from her home in Vallejo, California. Even after a massive search was conducted by police, volunteers, and the FBI, and several suspects were investigated, no trace of Ziana was yet found. I'll pick up the story after eight terrible months have passed, with Ziana's family still searching for answers. In August 2000, another Vallejo girl would vanish off the streets. Vallejo residents would find themselves reliving a nightmare, but this time the story would end very differently and a predator would be unmasked. This is part two of the case of serial predator Curtis Dean Anderson, the abduction of Mitzi Sanchez. Seven-year-old Ziana Fairchild had been missing for eight months. Even with hundreds of hours of investigations, searches, and police interviews, the trail had gone cold. But her great-aunt Stephanie Kahalakulu and her mother Antoinette Robinson and the entire city of Vallejo had not given up hope and continued to show up to volunteer at the Ziana Fairchild Search Center every week. The yellow ribbons placed around trees and telephone poles signaling hope that Ziana would be found and brought home were still visible around Vallejo when a second little girl went missing, just about two miles east from where Ziana was last seen. The disappearance of eight-year-old Mitzi Sanchez had many factors in common with Ziana's disappearance. She was just a year older than Ziana had been when she vanished. The girls were similar in appearance, dark hair, olive skin, and brown eyes, and both had been traveling between school and home on a Thursday when they disappeared. Investigators had been in the process of interrogating William Perkins Jr. as a suspect in Ziana's disappearance after he was picked up on an outstanding warrant for domestic violence. Perkins, who'd had a history of sexual offenses against children, had stayed overnight in the small studio apartment inhabited by Ziana, her mother, and her mother's boyfriend, Robert Turnbow. The next morning, Ziana had vanished. Turnbow had also been investigated as a possible person of interest in the case, after police discovered he'd lied about driving Ziana to school the last morning she was seen. But they didn't have enough evidence to arrest him. Now with Perkins in custody on the other charges, and a second girl missing, police began to suspect that a serial predator may be at work in Vallejo. The San Francisco Bay Area had experienced several abductions of young girls beginning in the summer of 1988. Amber Swartz Garcia was seven when she vanished from her front yard in Pinole, California, while jumping rope. Her mother, Kim Swartz, spent years searching for her daughter without any resolution. She created the Amber Foundation for Missing Children and dedicated her life to helping other parents. She would help coordinate search efforts in Ziana's disappearance as well. The next abduction happened in the Bay Area in late 1988. Nine-year-old Michaela Garrick, rode her scooter to a corner market near her home in Hayward, California. After exiting the store, a friend who'd accompanied her witnessed an unidentified Caucasian man grab Michaela as she went to retrieve her scooter. The other girl ran into the store to summon help, but within seconds, the man drove away with the nine-year-old, and she was never seen again. Two months later, 13-year-old Eileen Micheloff was walking home from school in the East Bay town of Dublin, California, and simply vanished. Eileen was a competitive figure skater who aspired to be a pediatrician. She also was never seen again. Just days after Christmas 1991, 
Amanda Nikki Campbell, age four, was last seen riding her bike just doors down from her home in Fairfield, California. Her bicycle was found abandoned a few blocks from her home, but Nikki had vanished. Investigators couldn't say that all these abductions of girls were related, but thought that two girls, Ziana and Mitzi Sanchez, who'd gone missing from the relatively sleepy town of Alejo, California, within just months of each other, just might be. On August 12, 2000, Mitzi Sanchez was walking home from Highland Elementary School in Vallejo, where she attended third grade. Just a couple of blocks before she made it home, a man pulled his car up to the curb and got out. As Mitzi passed the man, who was walking with the help of a cane, he asked her to help him retrieve something from inside his car. As she slowed, the man grabbed her around the waist and threw her into the car onto the passenger side floorboard. He drove around with the terrified child until it got dark. Pulling into the parking lot of a Vallejo hardware store, he pulled out a padlock attached to a long chain. He shackled the girl's ankle to the car's gear shift, forced her to put on a cheerleading outfit, and made her drink beer and wine. He molested her for the next two days, hiding her in the vehicle. Whenever he left the car, he made her get down on the floorboard, covered her with blankets, and placed a shade in the front window so she couldn't be seen by anyone passing by. On Saturday, after keeping Mitzi chained to his car for over 40 hours, he drove with her an hour south to a Santa Clara business to try and get some money from a former employer. He left Mitzi in the car. Mitzi noticed that he'd left his key ring behind. Seizing her chance, she frantically began trying to fit each key into the padlock chained to her ankle. One fit, and when the lock clicked open, she sprang from the car and began running across the parking lot. Her kidnapper had just exited the building and began running after her. But Mitzi ran in front of a delivery driver who was behind the wheel of a Viking freight truck. The driver, seeing the little girl dash in front of his semi, slammed on the brakes. Without slowing, Mitzi climbed up his door and launched herself through the open window and onto his lap. My name is Mitzi Sanchez. I've been kidnapped. He's coming. He's going to kill me, she yelled. The driver, Carl Tafua, recognized Mitzi from all the media coverage about the girl who had vanished just that week. The driver saw the man turn and run to his car and drive away. He was able to copy down the license number and description of the vehicle. Mitzi was taken to a hospital to be checked out by doctors and also gave information about her abductor to police. Her family received the phone call that they had been praying for for the last two days. Mitzi was found, and she was safe. Mitzi's August 3rd birthday party had been scheduled for that week, and when she returned home, hundreds of well-wishers lined her street with signs and balloons and sang happy birthday to the tearful and tired little girl. About her daughter Mitzi, her mother, Susana Velasco Sanchez, said, She is a hero. She got away. She outsmarted him. I'd like to thank our new sponsor for today's episode, Monk Pack. It's a new year and many of us set goals to eat better and take better care of our health. I'm always looking for tasty snacks that contain less sugar to meet my better health goals. But to be honest, sometimes that's hard to find. Monk Pack makes snacks that fill you up, satisfy your cravings, and contain one gram of sugar or less. And best of all, they taste awesome. I'm loving Monk Pack Keto Granola Bars. Looking for a great tasting keto snack? I totally got you covered. With just one gram of sugar, two grams of net carbs, and only 140 calories, they're the perfect snack to grab when I'm on the go, which is always. Hey, I'll be real. I've tried a bunch of keto snacks while trying to watch my carb and sugar intake, and most of them end up sitting on the shelf. They just don't taste that great. So I was so happy to discover that I love the taste of Monk Pack Keto Granola Bars. Sometimes it's hard to choose which flavors I like best. The Maple Pecan Bars are super yummy, but I also love the Coconut Cocoa Chip for a chocolate fix. Besides being keto-friendly, they're also gluten-free, grain-free, plant-based, and non-GMO. Try them for yourself and you'll see. And we have a special deal for our listeners. Get 20% off your first purchase of any Monk Pack product by visiting monkpack.com and entering our code once at checkout. And Monk Pack is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% satisfaction guarantee. 
So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll exchange the product or refund your money, whichever you prefer. To get started, just go to monkpack.com. That's M-U-N-K-P-A-C-K.com and select any product. Then enter the code once at checkout to save 20% off your purchase. This episode is also brought to you by The New Yorker. The New Yorker stands apart for its commitment to truth and accuracy, quality writing, and storytelling. The New Yorker is considered by many to be one of the most influential publications in the world. I've been a longtime subscriber to The New Yorker. I first picked it up after seeing its great magazine covers and then became a fan of its articles, which can be accessed both in print and online. Whether you prefer political commentary, stories on the environment, film and television reviews, the arts, fiction, or humor, there's something for everyone in The New Yorker. As a true crime listener, you've probably either read the book or listened to the podcast Catch and Kill, written and produced by Ronan Farrow, a New Yorker investigative reporter and contributing writer. The New Yorker exposed the first sexual assault allegations against movie producer Harvey Weinstein and covered the unfolding events in a fascinating series of articles. This is only a small sample of what you'll discover within the pages of The New Yorker or as a digital subscriber. In both print and digital issues, The New Yorker has content from the best writers in America today. For a limited time, you can get 12 weeks of The New Yorker for just $6. That's a savings of 50%. Plus, listeners of my show will receive an exclusive tote bag, free. Go to thenewyorker.com slash once and use promo code once at checkout. That's N-E-W-Y-O-R-K-E-R dot com slash once and promo code ONCE to get 12 weeks off The New Yorker for just $6 and a free tote bag. NewYorker.com slash ONCE and promo code ONCE. A note before we continue. Mitzi Sanchez was identified in the media after her abduction. After she was found, her name was no longer reported to the public due to her age and because she was a victim of sexual assault. Mitzi is now an adult and has come forward to tell her story in order to help other children avoid being victims. In 2018, she started the Mitzi Sanchez Foundation. She travels to schools and other organizations speaking to children about how to stay aware of their surroundings and other safety tips. For this reason, I've also named her in this episode. Mitzi Sanchez's abductor was quickly identified as 39-year-old Curtis Dean Anderson. Hours after the little girl escaped, Anderson was arrested at the San Jose boarding house where he was residing. Anderson was born in Vallejo in 1961. His father, Howard William Anderson, was an Air Force vet and worked as a sheet metal worker. His mother, Corinne, was a stay-at-home mom. Anderson would downplay the abuse his father subjected him and his family to while he was growing up. Like many felons I've researched, he would say his home life was, quote, fine, and that he was never abused, and would paint a picture of spending time with his father fishing and playing baseball. Anderson's mother would tell a different story. Her husband was an abusive alcoholic, she said, who beat her and their four children when he was in a drunken rage. Curtis, she would later report, would defend her against her husband's beatings. Curtis Dean Anderson would leave school by the age of 13. He said he began working as a welder. His life of crime started early as well. At the age of 16, he held up a convenience store with a buddy. When a police officer drove by and saw the robbery in progress, the boys took the cashier hostage. Anderson would say that the clerk was held for two days, during which time they all got drunk together. After they finally released him, he went to the police. Anderson was convicted of first-degree kidnapping and robbery and sent to a state school for boys. Following in his father's footsteps, Anderson began drinking to excess at an early age. He continued to commit crimes and be arrested. He was arrested multiple times on drugs, theft, vandalism, and other charges. His probation officer would write in his report that Anderson possessed, quote, no sense of right and wrong. Then in 1991, Anderson asked a female acquaintance for a ride to work. When she arrived, he brandished a gun and taped her wrists together. He drove through the night, saying he was planning to rob a bank. When he grew tired, he let her out of her restraints 
and had her take over driving. They crossed into the state of Oregon, and when Anderson fell asleep at a rest stop, she escaped. He was charged with kidnapping and sentenced to six and a half years in prison and paroled in May of 1999. Ziana Fairchild went missing seven months later from his hometown. When Mitzi's mother saw a photo of the man who was arrested for kidnapping her daughter, she recognized him. She reported to the police that she'd seen him twice. The day Mitzi had been abducted, she'd seen Anderson standing on the corner near her home smoking. The second time she remembered seeing him was the day after Mitzi went missing. Volunteers had gathered at the Sanchez home to help search and post flyers. Anderson had been there that day, she recalled, volunteering to search. Anderson was booked into the Solano County Jail. Two months later, in October 2000, he was formally charged with kidnapping and child molestation and held without bail to await trial on those charges. Meanwhile, investigators were looking into whether Anderson might be involved in any other abduction cases, including Ziana Fairchild's. One connection was made when it was discovered that Anderson had also briefly worked for Vallejo City Taxi Cab, the same cab company where both Ziana's mother Antoinette Robinson and Robert Turnbow had worked. It was further discovered that Anderson had quit that job the day before Ziana went missing. There were conflicting reports about whether he had known or even spent time at the apartment of Robinson and Turnbow while Ziana lived there. At first, Robinson said she thought Anderson had been a visitor and met Ziana, and then she said he hadn't. Neighbors reported that many people came and went from Robinson's studio apartment at all hours, and it's still not confirmed whether Ziana had ever come in contact with Anderson, although it's a real possibility. Anderson had been interviewed but not charged in Ziana's kidnapping. He denied having anything to do with the case. But just weeks after his arrest for Mitzi's kidnapping, he told his brother Zach that he had kidnapped Ziana. Zach, who said his brother was a pathological liar and had been his whole life, didn't take it seriously. Anderson also confessed to another inmate while he was in jail that he was responsible for kidnapping Ziana. The inmate wrote a letter to the authorities reporting this confession. However, when Anderson was interviewed by investigators, he denied any involvement. Anderson would periodically grant reporters interviews. He enjoyed manipulating the press by telling them that he would give them a scoop and then hint at other crimes he might be involved with. He alluded to Ziana Fairchild's kidnapping several times. In October 2000, on the eve of Anderson's preliminary hearing for, for the kidnapping charges in the Mitzi Sanchez case, he granted an interview to Christy Belcamino, a journalist with the Contra Costa Times. Belcamino recounts this conversation and several others she would have with Anderson over the next few months in her book titled Letters from a Serial Killer. Belcamino met with Anderson with the goal of asking him point blank if he had kidnapped Ziana. Anderson talked around that subject and many others, never giving a clear yes or no answer to anything. For example, when she asked him straight out if he'd ever killed anyone, Anderson answered, I've left people laying on the ground and not moving when I'm done with them. He said he wouldn't admit to any other crimes because he, quote, wasn't hungry for the DA to come and give me more charges, unquote. But in a subsequent interview with Anderson, Del Camino writes that he began to bring up the possibility of other crimes he'd committed over the years. In one instance, he held up a piece of paper that he flashed to her through the thick plexiglass separating her from the prisoner. It read, First Kidnap, Rape, Kill, 1984. She asked how many other murders he was responsible for, and Anderson answered, Less than a dozen. Del Camino had become close to Ziana's great aunt, Stephanie Cahalakulo, and hoped to get an answer for her from Anderson on whether or not he had any knowledge about Ziana. She reported back to Stephanie what Anderson had told her. It was then that Stephanie told the reporter that Anderson had been playing a cruel and manipulative mind game with her as well. In October of 2000, while Anderson was awaiting trial for Mitzi Sanchez's abduction, he wrote a letter to Ziana's great-aunt, 
who'd raised her as her own daughter for the first seven years of her life. Stephanie Kahilakulu received a letter from Anderson asking her to visit him in jail. He told her he may have information to share with her about Ziana. Stephanie immediately made arrangements to visit the jail. Finding what had happened to her daughter was the sole focus in her life. If Anderson knew anything, she wanted to hear it. Stephanie sat across from the accused kidnapper and child molester, separated by a thick pane of plexiglass set into a cinder block wall. As she lifted the phone receiver in order to hear his voice, she was struck by how much older he looked than his 39 years. His dark blonde hair was thinning, his eyes were sunken and fixed in a hard stare. She waited for him to speak, but when he didn't say anything, she began peppering him with questions, desperate for any information about Ziana and afraid he'd changed his mind about talking with her. Did he have any information about her daughter, she asked? Did he know where she was? Was she being taken care of? Was she being fed? And did she have other children to play with? She asked him for proof that he'd seen Ziana. What were her favorite foods? Where did she have a birthmark, she quizzed. Instead of speaking, Anderson took out small pieces of paper and a pencil he'd hidden in his sleeve and wrote notes, which he then held up to the glass for Stephanie to read. She assumed he didn't want prison officials who monitored inmates' visits to hear what he had to say. One of the first notes he showed Stephanie made a chill go up her spine. Ziana home alive. $75 a week, it read. Stephanie wisely refused to agree to give him any money unless he could prove that Ziana was okay. The visit ended soon afterward. Anderson then began writing Stephanie letters. He told her to keep these letters a secret if she wanted to keep Ziana alive. Anderson said that he'd approached Ziana and promised her a trip to Disneyland to get her into his car. He'd kept her with him for two weeks, he said, before he'd passed her on to other people, who now had possession of her. He began making demands of Stephanie to, quote, keep Ziana alive. He told her when he wanted her to come visit him and even what he wanted her to wear. I like that black sweater you wore Saturday, read one letter. Wear it Wednesday and put your hair up. His letters were full of vulgar sexual language. He would describe what he'd done to Ziana and what he wanted to do to her. Police officers who'd been working on Anderson's case told Stephanie to be careful. They told her that she was his, quote, type, as all his previous adult victims had been petite women of Latin background. Stephanie made sure to wear her biggest, bulkiest sweaters that covered her whenever she visited the prison. Even so, she felt defiled and degraded every time she left his presence. Still, she continued to visit in hopes that it would lead to Ziana's discovery. In one letter, Stephanie pleaded with him that if he did truly know where Ziana was and she was alive, to please let her at least talk to her. She begged, I need to make this up to her for allowing her to come to California. I did not decide or plan for her to come, and I didn't agree with it, but I didn't fight it, and I should have. She had a very happy life before coming here to Vallejo. Anderson then cruelly taunted her for not fighting to keep Ziana in Colorado, where she was safe. His demands to her increased, and his letters became more threatening. She had not deposited money in his prison account, he said, and he was angry. Quote, you fooled me, just like all the other bitches, he wrote happy searching forever, end quote. If she didn't start visiting him and wearing what he told her, she would be punished and Ziana would be tortured by the people holding her, he threatened. For two months, Anderson wrote increasingly vile letters to Stephanie. You can explain to your other daughter and son that because I'm an asshole and you are stupid, they will never see Ziana again, he ranted in one. It's all your choice. I can live with what I'll have to do. Can you? Finally, Stephanie agreed to put $100 into his prison account. She had stopped agreeing to visit him. Then Anderson told her he wanted to negotiate some perks from the district attorney in exchange for Ziana's return. Stephanie now dared to hope. She prepared for Ziana's return and even purchased some new clothes and toys in anticipation of her arrival. But Anderson's demands were unreasonable, and he didn't provide any useful information to the DA about Ziana. In the end, his promises went nowhere. Ziana's family's hopes were cruelly dashed once again. Then a month later, in January of 2001, over a year after Ziana had vanished, their worst nightmare was visited upon them, when a small skull was found in the Santa Cruz Mountains. 
All they could do was pray as they waited to hear if they had at last found their sweet girl, Ziana. On January 19, 2001, a road worker was traveling up Soda Springs Road, a rural mountainous area between Los Gatos and Santa Cruz, California. He saw what he thought was a boulder in the middle of the road and got out to look. What he found was a small skull. He called the police. The skull was missing its lower jaw, but the top teeth were still intact. A preliminary examination by the coroner identified the skull as belonging to a five- or six-year-old child who'd probably died at least six months earlier. DNA was extracted, and a mold was made of the remaining teeth in order to attempt to match it to missing children, including Ziana Fairchild. The area where the skull was found was about 20 miles from Anderson's boarding house, but now Anderson had stopped talking. A month after the discovery of the skull, it was determined by forensic testing that the remains belonged to Ziana Fairchild. Now all her family was left with was the process of grieving for their little girl. A memorial shrine was placed outside the Ziana Fairchild Search Center in Vallejo. Officers and volunteers who'd spent 14 months searching for the missing girl began bringing teddy bears, handmade cards, letters, balloons, and flowers to leave in her memory. So many people wanted to come to pay their last respects to Ziana and her family that her memorial service was held at the Solano County Fairgrounds. Besides her family members, Others who spoke at the service included Vallejo Police Lieutenant Joanne West and Mayor Tony Intintoli. Ziana's cultural heritage was honored with performances by both a Hawaiian musical group and chanting ceremonies by Vallejo's Intertribal Council of Native Americans. Hundreds of purple and yellow balloons were released at the conclusion of the service. In July 2002, Curtis Dean Anderson was found guilty of kidnapping and sexual assault of Mitzi Sanchez and sentenced to 251 years in prison. Anderson had provided details to his cellmates about Ziana's abduction and murder, and had also bragged on and off the record to reporters and Stephanie Kahalakulu. Some of the details he shared were gruesome and cruel, and seemed designed for shock value. Anderson's attorney would claim that all of Anderson's bragging about various crimes were simply lies he told in order to have a bargaining chip in prison. He wanted to get hip surgery approved for a motorcycle accident injury he'd received in 1999. He also wanted dental work done. Years of drug use and alcohol abuse had taken its toll and ravaged his teeth. But other details Anderson had shared would be used by investigators to make their case against him for Ziana's kidnapping and murder. In one conversation with Stephanie, Anderson mentioned that Ziana had been told her grandmother was coming to California to take her on a trip. Stephanie and Ziana's great-grandmother, Lita Domingo, had been planning to take Ziana to Hawaii to visit family before her disappearance. There was no way Anderson could know this unless he'd talked to Ziana, Stephanie said. Investigators compiled all the information Anderson had given to reporter Christy Belcamino, Stephanie Kahalakulu, his brother Zach Anderson, Anderson's cellmates in the Solano County Jail, and others. Some of the interviews Anderson granted in jail to reporters were recorded by jail personnel. Three investigators worked for months to verify Anderson's statements, a Vallejo police officer, a Santa Clara County Sheriff's investigator, and a district attorney's office investigator. They spoke to witnesses and sought out evidence to bring charges against Anderson related to Ziana's disappearance. In 2004, Charges were filed against Curtis Dean Anderson in Santa Clara County for the murder, kidnapping, and child molestation of Ziana Fairchild. Anderson had made many claims to many people about committing murders and other heinous crimes. However, it's likely that many of his brags were lies, used to either taunt his victims' families or try and manipulate them and the justice system to provide him with special treatment in prison. He claimed to have information he would reveal about many unsolved cases and would even confess to murders of other unidentified women in exchange for certain perks and privileges. I'll detail more of those cases in part three of this series. 
For this episode, we'll focus on what Anderson claimed to know about Ziana's case. Just a warning, Curtis Dean Anderson is one of the more disgusting predators I've covered on this podcast. He enjoyed sharing lewd and gruesome details about his child victims. I won't go into graphic detail about what he said, but I'll need to give you some idea of the claims he made in order to weed out the truth from the lies. Anderson was indeed a pathological liar, as his brother had said. If we look at his pattern of behavior in the abduction of Mitzi Sanchez, I think we can determine how much credence we can give to some of his more outrageous claims. But first, I'll summarize which of Anderson's own claims and other evidence investigators were able to use to charge him with Ziana's murder. Anderson said he'd once given Ziana a ride in his cab. This is possible since he worked, however briefly, at the same cab company as her mother and her mother's boyfriend. Her mother gave conflicting statements whether she knew Anderson or not, but if he had been around the apartment in the past, it is possible that Ziana thought she knew him and willingly got into his car when he offered her a ride to school that cold December morning. Witnesses in Ziana's neighborhood said they had seen Ziana with Anderson just days before her December 1999 disappearance. They identified both Anderson and his vehicle. It was the same car from which Mitzi Sanchez would escape eight months later. Investigators also believed the account provided by Anderson's Solano County jailmate. Anderson had confessed the murder of Ziana to him in detail weeks before there was any connection between him and Ziana's case, made either by prosecutors or speculated about in the media. The inmate had sent a letter to the Solano County District Attorney's Office outlining Anderson's claims immediately afterward. Vallejo police had also connected Anderson to another child who'd been approached by him, but had miraculously escaped sharing the same fate as Ziana. Another eight-year-old girl who attended the same school as Mitzi Sanchez picked Anderson out of a photo lineup as the man who lured her into a brown four-door sedan while she was walking to school. The man was walking with a cane and asked the girl to help him reach a roll of tape that was sitting on the front seat of his car. He said he needed it to fix the broken passenger side window. The girl crawled into the car from the driver's side, and Anderson began to close the door. At that moment, another car drove up, and Anderson, probably believing the other driver could identify him, gave her $5 and let her go. The little girl reported the strange incident to her foster mother, but no report was made to police at that time. Investigators noted the similarities in how Anderson lured the children into his car as well as the fact that all three of the known victims, Mitzi, Ziana, and the third girl, had all been approached by Anderson on a Thursday. Anderson would be secretly recorded while he was in jail talking about kidnapping Ziana. After luring her into his car, he claimed he'd taken her to his room at the boarding house in San Jose, over 75 miles south from Vallejo. He said he'd plied her with sweet alcoholic drinks, root beer schnapps, to keep her compliant. There, he'd kept her for several weeks. In one taped interview with a reporter, Anderson described how he'd made videotapes of sexual acts he'd forced on the child. As to how Ziana died, Anderson told several versions. He'd bragged to other inmates that he'd strangled her while she was being raped. He'd made a video of the killing, he said. No such video has ever been found. He told others that he'd beheaded the child. However, this claim was made after Anderson had learned that only Ziana's skull was recovered. It's more probable that, after learning this, he decided this was a way to shock the public and torture Ziana's family even further with this lurid detail. In many cases, when a body is found outside and after some time has passed, only some remains will be found due to decomposition, exposure to the elements, and animal predation. It's more likely that this is why only part of the skull was able to be recovered. In another version, Anderson told of wrapping up Ziana's body after he drugged her and then asphyxiated her. He'd driven up to the Los Gatos Hills where he dumped the body over a side of an embankment. This more closely matched the description of the area where the remains were found. In one conversation recorded by the prison, Anderson was asked by a reporter how Ziana had died. Anderson explained that he was a longtime drug user and knew what kind of drugs and how much to give Ziana to cause her to die of an overdose. I know what drugs do, okay? He can be heard saying on the audio recording, it's all body weight. He went on to say that the child's last words had been, I'm tired. 
We can only hope that after however long her hellish ordeal lasted, Ziana's death came quickly and painlessly. Some of Anderson's claims, of course, can never be verified, but some of the details ring false. His story about keeping Ziana alive for weeks at his boarding house seems unlikely. Boarding houses are communal dwellings where multiple residents often share common areas like kitchens, hallways, and bathrooms. How no one would notice a seven-year-old being brought into the home and residents having no recollection of Anderson having another person in his room for weeks is hard to fathom. If this method of concealing his victim had been so flawless, it's likely he would have used it a second time after abducting Mitzi Sanchez. He was still living in the boarding house at the time, but instead kept her chained inside his vehicle until she managed to escape. Luring his victim to his vehicle by using his hip injury as a ruse to ask for help was part of his M.O., and one that he would later admit to other prisoners was inspired by Ted Bundy's crimes. Anderson wished to emulate the prolific serial killer. He would later tell another reporter that, like Bundy, he'd gotten away with murdering over a dozen victims. I'll detail those claims in part three of this series as well. In December 2005, six years after Ziana vanished, Curtis Dean Anderson pled guilty to the kidnapping, sexual assault, and murder of Ziana Fairchild. A sentence of 50 years to life was added to his already lengthy sentence for the abduction of Mitzi Sanchez. He was sent to Corcoran State Prison and housed among such infamous murderers as Charles Manson, Juan Corona, Phil Spector, and Dana Ewell, whose case I detailed in Season 2, Episode number 50 of this podcast. Anderson died two years later at the age of 46. The district attorney had not sought the death penalty for Anderson due to his failing health. It was unlikely he would survive long enough for the sentence to go through California's lengthy appeals process and be carried out. Anderson had also agreed to plead guilty to avoid the death penalty and asked to be housed in a secure medical unit where he might undergo treatment instead. He died on December 9, 2007 of medical complications due to cancer. Deanna's biological mother, Antoinette Robinson, was unfairly vilified in the community after her daughter was abducted, her attorney Dan Healy told the San Francisco Chronicle. She and Bobby Turnbow had to move away from Vallejo, and they broke up soon afterward. Robinson became homeless until a woman who read about her story took her in. It was reported that Robinson was living in the woman's home and given access to a car and money. Robinson said the woman was her guardian angel. Sometime after that, Antoinette Robinson dropped out of sight. Stephanie Kahalakulu had a falling out with Robinson, who she blamed for the danger Ziana found herself in while in her custody. She wasn't taken care of, Stephanie vented to a reporter, and she wasn't watched. Maybe her last thoughts, or why her family wasn't there to help her, Stephanie lamented. Stephanie moved her family from Colorado to the San Francisco Bay Area during the 14-month search for Ziana. Afterward, she remained living in the Berkeley, California area and became close to Mitzi Sanchez and her family, who she reached out to when Mitzi first went missing. Mitzi returned home to Vallejo, and she and her family tried to return to a normal life. But Mitzi's ordeal as a victim of Curtis Dean Anderson would have long-term repercussions on her life. She describes not being able to relate to anyone while growing up. At first, immersing herself in therapy and playing sports helped to keep the demons at bay. But she then suffered a sports-related injury and was sidelined. She became depressed and quit therapy, which she felt was no longer helping. Instead, she turned to drugs and alcohol to cope with the pain and trauma she'd experienced at such a young age. She became angry and began fighting and joined a local gang where she could express her rage freely. In 2009, at the age of 16, she was riding in the car with three other girls. The 20-year-old driver was intoxicated and lost control of the vehicle. I ended up flying through a windshield at 80 miles per hour, pretty much breaking every bone from my waist to my neck, Mitzi recalled in an interview with CNN in 2019. After being rushed to the emergency room, 16-year-old Mitzi discovered she was pregnant. 
She said it was the wake-up call she needed to get her life back on track. That same year, she learned about another eight-year-old girl who went missing from the nearby town of Tracy, California. Sandra Cantu disappeared from her mobile home park on March 27, 2009. Mitzi became active in the search for the little girl, but Sandra's story ended tragically when her body was found 10 days later concealed inside a suitcase and submerged in an irrigation pond. Mitzi was devastated, but said she realized that unlike Sandra and many other girls like her, she had been given a second chance at life. She now realized that she had a story to tell, and in doing so, she may be able to help keep other children safe. Mitzi first became a volunteer with the Class Kids Foundation, founded by Mark Class, when he broke ties with his original organization, the Poly Class Foundation. Mitzi volunteered to speak to groups about her story and spread awareness of how to keep children safe from predators. In 2018, she launched the Mitzi Sanchez Foundation. She continues to speak to children to educate them about personal safety. One example she shares is how Anderson lured her to his car by asking for help. She explains to kids that adults don't need the help of children in most cases. One way to get out of that situation, she says, is to tell the adult that you'll go get another adult to help and then run. She also has a safety app in production called Savior. Mitzi Sanchez says her most important role right now is being a mother. She says her daughter is aware of what happened to her when she was eight, and her daughter has taken the lessons her mother has taught her about staying safe and shares them with her friends and classmates. For years, she remained angry at Curtis Dean Anderson for what he did to her. But when she realized that her anger had become toxic to her well-being, she began to rely on her faith to help her let go of the rage. She was finally able to forgive her abuser and move on to find peace in her life. After that, I felt a freedom I have never felt before, Mitzi says. Months before his death, Curtis Dean Anderson told investigators that he'd committed other murders that he now wanted to confess to. He detailed for the FBI how he had abducted and murdered seven-year-old Amber Swartz Garcia from Pinole, California in 1988. The FBI and several local police jurisdictions would launch investigations into Anderson's claims, some of which went back to the early 1980s. I'll detail the rest of Anderson's alleged crimes and other missing women investigators believe he may have been responsible for on the last part of this miniseries, which will be released next week. That will do it for part two of this series on Once Upon a Crime. Thanks again for listening and telling a friend about the podcast. Don't forget you can support the show by becoming a Patreon member. Patreon now gives you several options to choose from to show your support. Besides five tier levels we've created for you to choose from, you can also pledge in euros, British pounds, or US dollars. As well, you can choose to pay monthly or save money by purchasing an annual membership. Go to patreon.com slash onceuponacrime to find out more and sign up. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. Our administrative research and production assistant is Lorena Garcia, and original music is by Aaron Michael Goldberg. Until next time, stay safe and be good to one another.